This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. I want to look at current events and analyze them from a prophetic and biblical perspective. Why? Because I believe there's a tremendous need for this. A tremendous need. Because even though there is news everywhere, especially the mainstream media, the mainstream media uh, completely leaves out reality. And by reality, I mean truth. Because truth can only ultimately be found in the Word of God and the reality of Jesus Christ. And truth can only be found when you analyze current events and situations through a biblical worldview. If you're just looking at it through a secular worldview, then you're already biased. You see, you're already looking at reality, let's say, with with uh, eyeglasses where you have been given a radically wrong prescription. I don't know if any of you uh, have gotten a pair of eyeglasses or needed a pair of eyeglasses or contact lenses or whatever, or accidentally put somebody else's contact lens in your eye or whatever. And I say that being the father of uh, three kids that are now adults. In families, that happens. <laughs> and if you have the wrong prescription, <laughs> you, uh, you, you know it instantly because things are distorted. You can't see right. So when you're looking at life through a secularized reality, which is what the mainstream media does, it's all distorted. It's, in sto- it's distorted by its very nature because you're leaving out the fabric of truth. And that's because there is a God who created the world according to his laws and principles, and reality, true reality, or as Dr. Francis Schaeffer said, final reality. That means the reality that really exists, whether you or me or somebody else has an opinion or a bias or doesn't want to believe something or whatever, there's a reality that exists that's, that's rock solid. It's a reality. It's God's reality. It exists whether or not people choose to believe in it or not. So there's a tremendous need to analyze situations through the lens of truth. So that's what we endeavor to do uh, on the Paul, Paul McGuire Report. Now, in addition, there are a lot of uh, secular or secularized uh, alternative media sites which, which in many cases offer good or even excellent um, analysis, but sometimes it's devoid of the spiritual dimension. And when I sp- say spiritual dimension, I'm specifically talking about the biblical dimension. And it's only by incorporating the biblical dimension that, again, you can arrive at truth. Okay, so let's get down to the bottom line. What's been going on the last couple of weeks? <clears throat> I would summarize it by saying this. Mass mind control. That's what's been going on. Mass mind control. And I don't use the word flippantly, but that's what's been going on, especially in America. Mass mind control. Things have happened in the last three to four weeks which have happened in reality, but you were not told the truth about them. So you receive the information through social media, through radio, through television, through uh, satellite, whatever, however you get your information, social media, whatever. Uh, You receive the information, but you didn't receive it Accurately, because either somebody very powerful, a puppet master pulling the strings of the puppets, uh, allowed there to be uh, information, imagery, video that was supposed to communicate reality. I mean, people still operate um, by this maxim seeing is believing. Well, look. I hate to break it to you, but if, but, but if you've been living in the media age ever since the invention of television, 
and the invention of uh, broadcast television or cable or satellite, um, seeing is no longer believing. You're a fool if you believe what you see, because as many of you know, in today's world, you can manipulate the images of uh, television reporting. You can manipulate the images of anything that is being videoed or filmed for so-called news or or so-called interviews or whatever. It can all be manipulated. They can edit stuff out. They can edit stuff in, or they can edit stuff out and then edit stuff in that really came from somewhere else or a different time period, and they can overlay graphics on it or pictures to hide the fact that that these two interviews, let's say, happened in two entirely different locations. They can manipulate audio by taking stuff, or if somebody is, let's say, making a three-sentence statement, and all the news is playing the three-sentence statement over all the networks. But the networks agree collectively to edit out the last part of the statement that's being made. So by, by deliberately editing it out, by chopping it off, and not airing the full statement, you alter the meaning, because in that last statement, there was the clarification, there was the emphasis, there was the ending that is all, all important uh, in enabling you to understand what somebody was trying to communicate or what somebody was trying to say. If you chop off the ending or the last yeah. sentence, <laughs> you know, you can reinvent any kind of meaning to something. So that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the sophistication of editing and the removal of images in video or the, or the addition of images or censoring certain things out. You know, we hear these uh, leaks from the so-called uh, Mueller hearings. Leaks everywhere. Okay, fine. But notice that the leaks are always selective. See, somebody's leaking stuff because they got a particular agenda, and they're choosing not to leak other stuff because it contradicts their agenda. So you have a completely distorted view of reality. So that's what I'm talking about by mass mind control. I remember when the late Dr. Francis Schaeffer wrote about this in one of his books, And this was, uh, Dr. Francis Schaeffer is the greatest evangelical Christian theologian over the last 150 years. And he wrote these books, I'm guessing, 35 years ago, about or more. And uh, in a couple of his books, he actually, uh, I think this book was called The Great Evangelical Disaster. It was called The Great Evangelical Disaster because it exposed the fact that, and this was 35 years ago at least, it exposed the fact that the evangelical church, starting way back then, had already started to drift away from the truths of the Bible, and that the evangelical church was already in the process of rejecting God's Word all over the place, and especially in areas Uh, that are considered politically correct, evangelical leaders, evangelical seminaries, etc., etc., churches, pastors, were rejecting the truth of God's Word and and accepting and embracing uh, not God's Word, but they were taking man's Word, which is humanism, and putting their faith in humanism, and then teaching their congregations to believe in humanism with a couple of Christian words sprinkled on it. Now, he was warning of this 35 to 45 years ago, intensively. So the name of the book was The Great Evangelical Disaster, and essentially that meant that the great evangelical disaster is the fact that the evangelical church is like the Titanic, the ship. And because it's not... um, because it rejected God's word, it smashes into this giant 
submerged iceberg and sinks and, and, and all the people which represents the Christians are destroyed, perish. My people perish for lack of wisdom or vision. So in this book, he introduced the concept of how in modern society, and remember, this is 35 to 40 years ago, they had just begun getting into this area, the mainstream media, and the people, the puppet masters, they just begun to get into it. And what he was saying was that in modern television broadcasting, and when he wrote his book, there was only three networks, but he was talking about how if they cover, if, if the secular humanist mainstream media covers any story, political, social, moral, whatever it is, they can completely uh, manipulate um, what people are watching on television with the planned hidden agenda to control people's thinking, to control people's belief systems by editing out anything that contradicts their agenda and making sure they have plenty of stuff that supports their agenda. Or by choosing to cover this news subject or this news story and then refusing to cover these news stories. Perhaps one of the most devastating and evil techniques to use by the mainstream media to, manip- to manipulate people's minds through mass mind control is not so much what they cover and they edit, although, although that's a huge problem. The really big problem is the fact that uh, mainstream media, what they choose not to cover, all the vitally important news stories, all the vitally important events that they're aware of, that they're deliberately and methodically choosing not to report on, not to broadcast on their networks, because they don't want you to know about it, that's the biggest way they can manipulate the minds of the masses. I'll give an example tonight. Um, Before I got into the studio, I was watching a large cable news network, one known for... uh, being conservative. It's no longer conservative. It's conservative, moderate, sliding every day towards liberal. And they um, interrupted their reporting, their normal reporting, to do a special on uh, something like, and this is probably a giveaway of who they are, it was one of these exposés on what happened to, to, oh yeah, what happened to the body or something, or who murdered Jimmy Hoffa. Now, most of you listening, a lot of you are not going to know who Jimmy Hoffa was, because this was a long time ago. I can barely remember what it was about. But Jimmy Hoffa was a big, big union boss. And as I recall, and this was a long time ago, I believe he was killed. Yeah, he was killed. And uh, either they couldn't find his body, I think that was it. So there was a cover-up regarding his murder. Okay, that was very important at the time. At the time, now it's irrelevant. It's totally irrelevant. It's a non-issue. So why is it that this so-called conservative moderate network is playing this expose of what happened to somebody who was murdered, you know, (laughs) decades and decades ago. That's basically irrelevant today. Why are they choosing to to take the minds of their viewers, which is sizable, and put them into like the twilight zone by covering an issue that's completely unimportant? Especially on a night that is literally exploding with the most critical, relevant uh, news stories that demand that, that they scream for coverage because they're so important. Why would you choose <clears throat> to take your network and, and basically put it in a swamp somewhere covering some stupid story that might be good for like 3 o'clock in the morning, somebody has insomnia and they want to watch a documentary. Why are you wearing that garbage? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because that, that network 
has had a regime change uh, that began, I guess, about a year ago, when the father who owned the network, who was, I guess, conservative, or at least far more conservative than the son who's currently running it. And I think it's the son and the daughter that are currently running it. Supposedly, the son and the daughter that are currently running this news network are like super liberals, but they got a big problem because even though they're super liberals, they have <clears throat> one of their biggest money ma- uh, makers in this this company that they own that they got from their father owns like you know everything in terms of media communications and all kinds of other stuff, but. In their, I guess, their television news division or whatever, and it's international in their ownership. Uh, this particular American cable news network that they own is very profitable. Okay, it's very profitable, very powerful. So they're smart enough business people to know that they can't just torch it as a conservative uh, network because that's how it was built as a conservative, moderate network. But you see, so they played the, they're, what they're doing is they're playing the switcheroo. Uh, that's an old expression, switcheroo. Uh, they're playing the switcheroo. <laughs> I'm laughing because I haven't heard anybody say that in a long time, including myself. The, sw- <laughs> the switcheroo, for those of you that don't know what that means, it's bait and switch. It's when you offer, when, you, when a television network made its money uh, branding itself as being conservative and its biggest uh, news people were conservative or moderates. And that's how they built their giant audience. That's how they built their fortune and got their money from advertisers. But then because of the... See, things in today's world are all topsy-turvy. Decades ago, Basically, all businesses were, were run according to the business model. And in a business model, <clears throat> the main concern is profit or loss. So when you're running any kind of uh, business enterprise, whether it's a news network or a restaurant or whatever, under the traditional business model, you have to answer to your stockholders and your priority is doing everything that you can do to make your customers happy, to keep your customers buying or watching, uh, to know what your customers like and don't like, and never to do anything that offends your customers or drives your customers away. You never do that in a traditional business model. Because in a traditional business model, you grow your business through happy customers or happy watchers of your news channel, and they spread the word for you. And that's how it grows. But in today's world, especially when it comes to all these media giants, the mainstream media, and a lot of other companies, big retailers and stuff, um, you, you constantly hear stories of where giant retailers, giant corporations, and, and giant uh, cable news networks or media people or Hollywood or media personalities are actually doing things which outrageously offend their customers. Uh, they, they're doing things, they're producing programs, they're making statements, they have bias, which you, you have to know is offending at least 50 to 40 percent of their viewers, watchers, or customers. Now, that's, that's the most egregious violation of, of a traditional business model that you could possibly have. But notice that all these big-time newspapers who are, are they're crashing and burning and, and the amount of uh, subscriptions that some of these prominent papers like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the amount of subscriptions that they're losing is like in a free fall. And a lot of other businesses, the same thing. There's giant social media companies that are annoying their customers, the people that use their social media platforms, they're, I mean, they're really annoying them, but they don't care. And they're hemorrhaging uh, customers. And Wall Street is, you know, 
is ready to fire the CEOs of some of these companies. But why does it happen? Because we've changed from being a traditional business model marketplace to what I call an ideology-driven marketplace, where having the right ideology, you know, conservative or liberal, having the right ideology is the number one most important thing. And it doesn't matter if you literally go bankrupt and lose all your customers. In fact, you should continue under this business model, the ideology-driven business model. You should continue to lose your customers, lose your audience, as long as you're being politically correct and uh, holding the right uh, political message, which is always liberal. Here's another example. All the comedy guys, late night comedy guys, okay? Now, many of you will not know of the person I'm speaking of because it was, goes back before your time. Johnny Carson was like the king of the late night comedians. Now, whether you like Carson or not, all the, 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 the big comedians, the late night comedians of that generation, and this goes back decades, and they had monster audiences, by the way. But they had a basic rule because they were uh, business model driven uh, comedy television programs. They deliberately did not, they were deliberately not political because common sense told them that at least on any given night, at least half their viewers would be Republicans, half would be Democrats, or half would be liberals, or and half would be conservatives on any given night. That's just the way it spins out, especially when you only had three networks back then. Now, the variables have changed somewhat, but not all that much. So the smart comedian would never do his jokes based on insulting half of his audience, like the conservative audience, because they didn't want to risk losing any of those people, because it means that they lose advertising dollars. Well, we have on every one of these late night comedians spend, uh, what, 15, 20 minutes of their opening monologue time making jokes that, that center around basically degrading, demeaning, insulting, making fun of uh, President Donald Trump. Okay? Night after night after night. So number one is, that is boring. Because any joke, night after night after night after night, is boring. Period. So it's not even good from a comedy model. Number two is, there's a huge percentage of their audience that has to be voters of President Bush or supporters of President Bush. And yet they're insulting approximately half their audience and driving them away. So, you see, they don't care. And these other networks don't care. Because they're ideology-driven. Now I'm going to ask you a question, which is, why do you think these news organizations, these entertainment and comedy corporations, why is it they feel so bold and comfortable in losing their audiences which means losing advertising dollars, which means losing ratings, which means losing money for their stockholders. Well, why, why, anybody who was sane would be like, I'm going to change stuff to make sure I increase my audience, not shrink it. Why are they all so comfortable? I'll tell you the secret. They are being secretly propped up. In other words, the only way you could be sane and at peace at the same time about losing money for your news television corporation or comedy show network or whatever. The only way you could be sane and relaxed at the same time is if, if you secretly knew that y you weren't losing money and you were, and you were making profits for your stockholders. E even though you're driving away let's say, 25% of your audience. Let's just throw out a number. Now, no businessman in his right mind expects to keep a profitable business and drive away 25% of his audience. But, but 
these people are comfortable losing, at, at minimum, I believe it's more, 25% of their audience. So why are they so comfortable? Why do they keep doing it? Because they are receiving secret cash flow from sources other than the traditional advertising revenue. Somebody's propping them up. And you say, how can you say something so outrageous? It's not outrageous, it's common sense. Why is it the New York Times and Washington Post continually uh, are biased and offend a good percentage of their readers and yet still stay in business? Because people prop them up. There are powerful billionaires who prop, prop them up. And there are other entities that secretly are propping them up. What does that tell you? It tells you you might have to walk through a door that you may be uncomfortable with, and that door is called the door of truth. You may have to investigate the possibility that there's a structure that you weren't aware of that is holding up all these mass media companies for, because they want. Um, the message, even though it's driving away a huge percentage of the audience, these invisible entities are, are keeping these media companies afloat because they want that propaganda message, that mind control message sent out. So this brings us to, to the obvious question. Is there some kind of secret funding going on by powerful unnamed entities that allows them to spread propaganda, um, even though they're losing money and traditional money, traditional advertising dollars. And, and the answer is that there has to be, because otherwise these companies would go belly up, and they're not. <clears throat> they're being bailed out. Who's bailing them out? Well, follow, follow the smoking gun, follow the trail of money. So back to this uh, cable news network. So on a night that is just red hot with important stories regarding the Mueller investigation, because there's so many lies being told, and the viewers of this powerful conservative moderate uh, television cable news network, they are tuning in to watch their network uh, uh, give a more conservative analysis of the news, conservative reporting, conservative investigation. They want to hear the truth, not just the propaganda that's being dished out on the other networks. But what does their network do? They shut out the lights in the middle of the hottest, hottest uh, news night of the week. They shut down the lights and take you back in time to some irrelevant story about somebody who got bumped off you know, decades and decades ago. That's irrelevant. Why did they do that? I think because they didn't want to put their news people in the awkward place of just faking it with their audience. And they're not allowed, somehow it was communicated to them that they weren't allowed to cover these stories from like a conservative perspective. And then somebody in management realized, well, if we cover the stories from the same liberal perspective, the Mueller investigations, as the other networks, our audience is going to be furious at us. So the sneakiest thing we can do to dodge the bullet is to uh, air some documentary on the death of, of some uh, union boss that happened, I don't know, 50 years ago or something that nobody knows about, nobody cares. Pretty sneaky, huh? That's what it's like an Orwellian thing. So your minds are being manipulated because you're being deprived of important information. Okay, so <clears throat> now we have, we go back just before the Mueller thing. It's amazing how things are timed, isn't it? The Mueller thing starts to drop its, you know, I can't say explosive truths. It's irrelevant truths. I mean, he was hired, after all, to, to investigate Russia conclusion, uh, collusion. 
Right. I haven't heard anything on Russia collusion, have you? Okay, so well, that's one thing. Then the other thing is that um, the Bush uh, funerals, or it's one funeral, but it lasted over many days. It was held in at least three spectacular uh, church sanctuaries. There were endless choirs, endless prayers, uh, songs, the reading of scripture verses. Uh, You would have thought, I mean, it was so over the top. And now, again, here's the first clue that there's something wrong. Whenever all of the mainstream media, which are owned by the same people, by the way, when all, when all of the mainstream media cover a story with the exact same amount of attention, and they're all reading from the script, same script, so they're all saying the same things, and they're all covering the events the same way, and all their reporters or whatever are, are making the same remarks about the late President Bush, you know that this is like a rigged thing, okay? This is not how real news coverage plays out. So what did you just go through? You went through four, five, six days of the most elaborate or more 24-7 coverage of the Bush funeral and all the services and all the tributes in three different sanctuaries, the casket was constantly being moved, draped. Uh, the thing was so visually spectacular in every sense of the word. There's no way, by the way, judging from the complexity of the, the multiple cameras for every shot. I remember watching one sanctuary where uh, Bush Sr.'s casket was being taken out of, uh, draped in the American flag being honorably carried by soldiers <clears throat> and then loaded into a, a specially designed uh, uh, hearse-type limousine made by Cadillac, Cadillac to, to carry a presidential coffin. And being somebody who's been in the news business and the entertainment in, uh, business industry uh, as a feature film producer and as a commentator for major cable news networks. I um, was just observing just the taking out of the casket draped in the American flag. They must have had like 11, 11 different separate cameras positioned from, from all different kinds of angles from rooftops. So just that segment, which was probably 45 minutes, they, it was like a mini film. They used like, uh, you know, 14 different cameras, 14 different camera angles, all perfectly timed and cued. You know, we saw one shot was a long shot looking down from a roof and you could see the, you know, it was, everything was gracefully and flowingly shot. Another shot was the close-up of, of the, the soldiers, you know, carefully putting the coffin in the, in the large Cadillac, and then all these different close-ups. And uh, it was like, that, just planning out that scene there with 14 cameras takes endless time to plan that, to map it out, and the whole thing. So... You add up all those complexity of shots because the same thing was happening inside the sanctuaries and every place else. Normally, it would take months to prepare for that level of excellence in video coverage and audio coverage and singing and music and lighting. It would take months because you're basically doing something above and beyond, well, no, in in many cases, it's above and beyond the grandeur of like an Olympic ceremony, or at the very least, like a a Broadway music, uh, you know, an an impressive Broadway musical with all the lighting and actors and stuff. 
I mean, it's it's the, you just can't do this. You know, he dies one day, and the next thing you know, you got this whole thing. No, this was planned months in advance, and it's a very very high quality and complex production. But it's based on some inherent lies. Now, tragically, because most Christians, evangelical Christians, and most Americans have been dumbed down. I hate to say that over and over again. It's just it's not a nice thing, but it's true. They've been dumbed down so they can't, their perceptive abilities have been degraded so they can't see what would be obvious to somebody whose perceptive abilities have not been degraded. First of all, you have all of the mainstream media repeating ad nauseum the same exact praise lines regarding Bush. I mean, word for word. And then said by the same commentator in a half an hour period, they repeat themselves with the same words of praise. What a humble guy he was, what a servant-like guy he was, duty, honor. They repeat the same words, all the networks, over and over and over again, and, you know. None of this was was genuine or heartfelt. It was all scripted. They were reading from scripts. And then you had, <clears throat> this was, I have never seen a, a massive television coverage of any event in my entire lifetime. This was probably the most royal, uh, pageant-like uh, uh, majestic series of ceremonies um, regarding the funeral of a world leader ever aired on international television. There's, there's nothing, been nothing like it. You would have thought he was the king of England. Uh, it was just, like, huge. And then the amount of praiseworthy things said about him, obviously when somebody passes away, the usual respectful custom is to say praiseworthy things about people. I got, I got that, but this was like, it never ended. It was just too much. And, and then he was portrayed deliberately. Somebody, there was a team of people, obviously, who sat around tables, who are highly trained people in messaging, advertising, media, uh, persuasion, um, indoctrination, um, scientific mind control, uh, marketing, branding, whatever you want to call it. There was a team of people who were very skilled in this area because they reinvented George Bush Sr. They revised his historical biography. Now, most people won't know that because at least half the audience watching this is too young to remember or to have visually remembered seeing uh, George Bush Sr. when he was president. So, so they have nothing to compare it to. But he was reinvented on purpose because a major, major theme, there were several like top themes, but one of the major themes, and that's why they had such an enormous amount of Christians, Bible verse readings, pastors preaching, prayers, uh, little antidotes and stories about what a committed, on-fire Christian uh, George Bush Sr. was. Just went on and on and on with the Christian stuff. Um, just It was constant. It was just like, I've never seen anything like it. Now, remember, our secular news media normally doesn't allow anything Christian to air, except by accident. So suddenly the floodgates are open, and they're singing some very traditional hymns, like Onward Christian Soldiers, which is not politically correct, and many other, you know, really strong Christian hymns, and strong Christian Bible verses and testimonies that normally they never allow. In fact, if you were a school teacher, or working in a public company, or uh, uh, pastor in some churches, if you, if you dared to, as a public school teacher or working for a corporation or something, or in most areas of our public life today in America, if you dared to read aloud these verses at your job or location 
or or sing the these kinds of hymns uh, or, you'd be suspended you'd be fined you'd be warned you'd be kicked out of class as a teacher you'd be sent home and you could be suspended fined fired and terminated for this kind of level of solid christian messages so here, all of a sudden, there's this space created for this. So you got to ask yourself the question, why? Why break the rules? Well, the rules are being broke because they want to target a, spe- a specific demographic of people. They en- want to influence and change the minds of a specific group of people. That's called brainwashing, by the way. So who do you think that specific group of people was? The specific people that this entire pageant was targeted for was not the liberals, was not uh, people who were indifferent to politics. It wasn't Democrats, because they don't like Bush, period, because he's a conservative and Republican. No, this was aimed at the, the, the deplorables, the deplorables, the people that uh, voted for President Trump, because they are, percentage-wise, strong conservatives, Bible-believing um, evangelical Christians, and people who are patriotic. That's what this was targeted towards, to change their minds for an ulterior motive. So. Also, one of the, uh, in the technology of mind control, or the science of mind control, and it is a science, and you need to know, by the way, how that science works. It's the only way you can protect yourself or your family or loved ones from becoming under the influence of mind control. I, I reveal all that to you in my book, Conquering the Matrix, which talks about scientific mind control and how it works, how it influences the subconscious mind through through using various forms of hypnosis that that is undetectable by most people. And you need to know about that because it's, it's, it's nations being under varying degrees of scientific mind control is the norm in today's world. It's what Aldous Huxley called the scientific dictatorship. And in terms of mass mind control, I write about that in my book, Conquering uh, um, Mass Awakening. And what you saw with the Bush funeral was mass mind control targeting the Trump voters, basically. And what was the game plan? The game plan was to create a mythological non-real George Bush Sr. and ignore the historical facts and reinvent him and rebrand him and package him as an on-fire evangelical Bible-believing Christian. And by the time they were finished with the funerals, the amount of praise regarding his Christian uh, commitment you would have thought he was Billy Graham. They sold him on purpose. They sold him as more of an evangelist, more of, more of a fervent Christian than Billy Graham was. That was the message. George Bush Sr. is, is above all, a on-fire, Bible-believing, evangelical, born-again Christian who's totally sold out to Jesus. That was his number one thing. That's what they said through all those ceremonies. That was the message. Now, first of all, that's not true. So they had to reinvent history. It is true that he was a Christian to whatever degree. It is true that he may have called himself a born-again Christian to whatever degree. And that's fine, because that's true. Now, I'm not going to judge his heart or his motives. But it's an historical fact that he was, to whatever degree, a, a, a evangelical Christian who, who claimed to be born again. But he was not a fervent, on-fire, uh, Bible-believing Christian. I remember his uh, office as president. 
I remember his public statements. He wasn't going around sharing his faith in Christ and all the rest of the stuff that they said he was doing. I mean, it, he, it was hidden. He didn't talk about it openly. So, what was that all about? That's called lying and deceit. That's propaganda does that. So they, so they created a new George Bush who was more of a Billy Graham than a George Bush. The one thing we do know about George Bush, and um, many of you remember this, what, what, his, what his number one thing was, was not Jesus, was not evangelism, was not Christianity. That was not his number one thing at all. His number one thing, which he made quite clear, was he devoted his life to bringing in the New World Order. He was known for the New World Order. That was his number one thing. He made speech after speech after speech after speech to the nation, to Congress, to the United Nations, over and over again. Uh, calling for the need and of the establishment of a new world order that would be run by a United Nations government. That is what his true passion was. It wasn't Jesus. So we need to we need to dismantle this propaganda and brainwashing with the truth. Now, if because they said he was diligent, I believe he was diligent. I believe he had incredible work ethics. I believe he was a goal setter. I believe that he was the people person they said he was. I think his people skills were off the chart. I believe that he uh, prioritized people and treated people with dignity. I believe that. Because you see, anybody who's an effective leader, an effective manager of people, has those skills. So that. I have no problem with that. Everything I knew about the guy, he had a very strong work ethic. I had the privilege of uh, having a long conversation with somebody who uh, worked with and for President Bush on a level that, that's about as close as you could get. Okay? And I won't say anything more because I can't. I can't say anything more. But I asked this individual about who the real George Bush was. And he was a kind man, and he was a people person, and he had Christian values, was a Christian. Um, and they were diplomatic. Um, and I can't share what Bush had to say about the New World Order, because that might reveal the identity of the person. But I'll just say, I will say this. He was, George Bush Sr. was very upset at, at a major Christian leader who, who kind of exposed the fact that Bush Sr. was a big promoter of the New World Order. Not that it was a secret, it's just that this Christian leader uh, kind of made it known to Christians who weren't paying attention even though Bush had said it nationwide on national television countless times. And Bush Sr. was very, very angry at this Christian leader for kind of alerting the Christian public to, the, to this whole New World Order thing. And I'll leave it at that. So, let's take it as a given that George Bush Sr. was who he, he, they said he was in terms of studying, diligence, you know, things like that. Okay, so if he was anywhere near the Christian that they said he was during his funeral services, he obviously, in line with the character that they were telling us he had, he would have been the type of Christian who would have known his Bible. If he was this much of an on-fire Christian like they said he was, given his type of gifting and personality, he would have known his Bible far better than the average Christian. And he would have understood that the Bible very clearly warns about um, the New World Order, a globalist society, a one-world government, a one-world religion, and a one-world economic system. Bush would have known that because he's the dumb man. 
And if he was truly committed to Christ at the level that the media said he was, he would have read his Bible. Because these are the only people who don't know that the Bible talks extensively about the new world order and a one world religion, one world economic system, and one world government. The only Christians who don't know that's in the Bible are those Christians that don't read their Bible. But that would have been out of character for George Bush. Now, as I've discussed with you numerous times in Genesis 11, God comes down to ancient Babylon at the Tower of Babel, and he uh, judges ancient Babylon because he sees in their hearts and he knows that it's Luciferian. And, and what was Luciferian about ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel? Well, one of the things is that they were the world's first one-world government, one-world religion, one-world economic system. But their religion had satanic principles in it. And they were a globalist society, but God still judged them. And the way God judged them is he split their global government into independent sovereign nation-states to create a check in months so that this global government couldn't rise up to be like an antichrist government. And his judgment consisted of dividing all the nations of uh, ancient Babylon into separate independent sovereign nations. So right there, God teaches us that his goal for, for mankind is for mankind to live in independent sovereign nation states which is called nationalism. Number two is the new world. What you saw occurring in ancient Babylon in Genesis 11 was the new world order come to light. The new world order is a very kingdom of heaven. It's when all the world is living under a one world government and a global system. That's what Bush was for. But, but what he was for was the very thing that God judged and said was evil and warned that if it ever came again, there would be a more severe judgment. Now, Bush would have known that because he would have read his Bible. Number two, Bush would have been familiar with the numerous passages of Scripture in the book of Revelation, where, again, this theme of a one-world government, a one-world religion, and a one-world economic system is clearly written about in the book of Revelation. It's called mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. So mystery Babylon is the satanic global system that comes about in the last days. And this satanic global system is the new world order that Bush was talking about. And it consists of a global system headed up by an uh, antichrist who's head of the one world government, and a false prophet who's head of the one world economic system and the one world religion, which is the new world order. That's why in the back of the U.S. dollar bill under the pyramid, it says, translated from the words in the Nuvus Order Seclorum, which means new world order. So Bush would have known that God is diametrically opposed to the new world order because he views it as a satanic rebellion by Satan. And Bush would have also known that in the Bible, Jesus Christ returns at his second coming with the armies of heaven and the angels, and Jesus Christ descends into the battle of Armageddon, where he fights against the forces of the world order, he fights against the one world religion, the one world economic system, and the one world government, the Antichrist and the false prophet, and Satan who is indwelling the Antichrist. And at his second coming, Jesus Christ defeats Satan and the New World Order and the global system known as Mystery Babylon at Armageddon. And then after he destroys it, Jesus Christ brings in the real, not the counterfeit, uh, the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. So, if Bush was this great, committed, Bible-believing Christian, he would have known that. And he would have taught it to his sons, George Bush Jr. and Jeb Bush, etc. 
So you have a real problem there. You got this propaganda message of what a wonderful Christian. You got the choir singing praises. You got Christian leaders pronouncing what a great Christian this guy was. You got testimonies of what a Christian he was. Uh, we're told how important Christianity was to him. You know, propaganda, like propaganda line after propaganda line. But the truth is what I just told you. And then you have another problem. President George Bush Sr. was a member, um, and Jeb Bush and uh, George W. Bush are members of a uh, an occult secret society known as Skull and Bones, which originated in Germany, and it came from Skull and Bones came from an ancient came from ancient occultic German secret societies like the Thule Society and the Vril Society. And Skull and Bones, as many of you know, the symbol of Skull and Bones is the crossbones in the human skull, just like our thing. And the Nazi, uh, many of the heads of the, of the Nazi movement under Hitler were members of German secret societies and members of Skull and Bones. So the SS troops, the officers, they would wear as an insignia on their hats uh, a skull and bones. They would wear an insignia or a pin of a skull and bones above their medals. And they would have on their belt buckle a large skull and bones. And this was the same secret society that the Bushes all belonged to. Because even though it are originated in Germany, and it was very much a part of Nazi Germany under Hitler. It also uh, uh, was birthed, I believe, in 1832 at Yale University in the United States of America. Skull and Bones was established. So there are numerous American presidents and many high-level political leaders like John Kerry, Bush Jr., Jeb Bush, George Bush, George Bush Sr., which are members of Skull and Bones. Now, if you read about the doctrines and beliefs of Skull and Bones, its goal is a new world order, and it has many satanic um, uh, doctrines. So you be the judge. The point I'm trying to make is that this mass mind manipulation was targeted towards unthinking Christians to stir them up emotionally and, and deliberately create a mental environment via television which would allow people's, uh, people to be stirred deeply emotionally, swept away by their emotions, and forget to think consciously and rationally about what the truth was. And this is a very powerful thing. That's called psychological persuasion, which is brainwashing, which is mind control. There are images that those people who are experts in propaganda, in brainwashing, in persuasion, in indoctrination, in advertising, marketing, uh, people who are experts in this, and you can see, by the way, as you are watching the, the funeral services unfold for George Bush Sr., it was obvious to me that you could, you, you could see um, the... Um, the evidences of people who, that the people who put this thing were experts in scientific mind control and propaganda, because, because the signature of it was everywhere. From the symbols, to the sound, to the video, they know how to pull your heartstrings on the deepest level. And they used heavily and, and intentionally Christians. I mean, they used Christians in the most intense way, to reinforce it for the purpose of establishing what I call a counterpoint. So the main objective of the Bush funerals, and I'm not saying Bush family conspired to do this, because I don't think the Bush family did conspire to do this. I think the funeral services of George Bush Sr. and, and the participation by the Bush family was simply the, 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 the emotional participation that any family 
that was affluent and powerful would want to do and, and how they would want to express, um, you know, kind of a, a, a memorial, a, a, a way of honoring uh, George Bush Sr. But I think that there are hidden um, organizations within our society that planned this thing out and implemented it in the manner that I'm suggesting. So when you um, think in light of the target group, the messaging was targeted towards born-again Christians. I would say there was a racial targeting of white middle class and working class. I would say that there was a, that, that uh, conservatives uh, were all targeted and, and evangelical Christians were targeted because it was so over the top on the, the amount of Christian stuff that happened. And the purpose was to show an idealized version of George Bush Sr., which means a, a, a larger-than-life version, a perfect version, when in reality he wasn't close to being that perfect, but they made it look like he was. You know, the perfect gentleman, the perfect diplomat, the perfect statesman, the perfect everything. and then. Subconsciously, they were, they were, oh no, subconsciously and in your face, uh, through the comments of the endless news reporters, they were challenging the viewer to make a comparison between the behavior, the words, and conduct of President Trump. And they were challenging the audience to compare President Trump's behavior with their falsified version of, um, uh, George Bush Sr.'s behavior. And then they, they had a pre-planned outcome, which was that the viewer should come away subconsciously thinking that, you know, Trump is just half-baked and not really of the high quality. He is like lower quality, very, very low quality. And, uh, uh, the, the person we need to emulate, the person that will provide leadership and healing for our society, is somebody in the mold and philosophy of George Bush Sr. That was the that was the embedded propaganda message. It was to undermine the support of Trump among evangelical Christians. That was the whole purpose of it. And that then there was many sub purposes like to innuendo that the way we would truly help our world would not be nationalists like Trump was, but to be internationalists like George Bush Sr. was. And, you know, the New World Order is about being an internationalist, a globalist. They're saying that was the, the correct way. Well, who was saying it? The globalists that own the, the mainstream media. So what you were watching was a propaganda event. Very skillfully done, and that's how minds are manipulated. Now, the thing that concerns me the most is that most Christians, you know, I was reading Christian media. Oh, no, I wanted to talk about this. Okay, so, you know, obviously I'm well trained in this area, I'm very aware of it. But none of us, including myself, are immune to the magnetic pull of propaganda. And mind control. None of us are immune from it. It tugs on all of our hearts, especially if you have the right images and stuff. I'll give you a personal example. First of all, we found ourselves very drawn in to, irresistibly drawn into watching the, the funeral services. And obviously, it elicited respect for George Bush Sr. and the things that he did right. But you see, I, I was already aware, uh, after doing so many years of research, researching this topic for 40 years, of the New World Order, etc., that I was already aware of George Bush Sr.'s strong connections to the New World Order and Skull and Bones. In the book uh, Trumpocalypse that I wrote with Troy Anderson, uh, we go into heavily the deep state's background 
and the New World Order and that whole thing. And uh, in my book, uh, um, A Prophecy of the Future of America, I do it very deeply. In fact, uh, every book that I've written has includes substantive chapters on this New World Order because it's the most powerful event happening in our lifetime. And it's the event that will happen before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so, despite having all this knowledge of this, and despite having all the knowledge of propaganda and how to guard yourself from it, and mind control and how to guard yourself from it, I remember being moved by the Bible verses that I heard read, like by Jenna Bush and some of the other Bush uh, family. And then... One of personally, one of my favorite hymns is "Onward, Christian Soldiers." It's very moving to me because it, I believe it reflects uh, an attitude uh, that we're in spiritual warfare, and Christians uh, Christians are called to to deny themselves, follow Christ, and and man the spiritual battlefields which is something you almost never hear in the modern evangelical church. They never sing onward Christian soldiers. It's too, uh, it's considered too unpolitically correct. And so whenever, and I think about that hymn a lot, I'm really moved. I'm stirred emotionally. And so they were in one of these cathedrals and they were singing onward Christian soldiers, which, you know, as they just said, is, it's not politically correct. And I was so moved that uh, uh, my eyes welled up with tears, and I was just, you know, I could feel the emotion, the strong emotion as they were singing on, Onward Christian Soldiers. It was moving me deeply, and I was being caught up in emotion. Now, but then, not because I'm a control freak, because I'm really not, but then I said to myself, interrupted the emotional response I was having, and I said to myself, the question, I said, they're singing Onward Christian Soldiers in a tribute to George Bush Sr. over the mainstream media. And yet this song, you would be arrested, fined, outlawed, or fired as a teacher or whatever, or even a, as a pastor. Uh, you're, the elders would probably can you for a second asking to sing Onward Christian Soldiers. So, what I noticed as I was observing myself, I was caught up in emotion, which triggers the subconscious, by the way. But when I began to think with my rational mind and just turn the off switch on my emotions for a moment, I want, because I wanted to analyze what I was watching and analyze my own personal emotional response without it being uh, brainwashed, let's say, by the emotion. I just wanted to critically think about it. So I did that, and I reviewed through my head, you know, we're, sing we're singing Onward Christian Soldiers uh, at George Bush's Sr.'s funeral, and yet he was not Onward Christian Soldiers in the sense of being a fervent Christian, a fervent evangelist. I mean, that's, not a, that's not a falsehood on my part. That was not part of his life in terms of the public knowing it. And that's where it counts. If you're really an evangelist, people would know about it. He was a huge advocate of the New World Order. That was a beat he was marching to. But he was not about marked onward Christian soldiers. That, that, that was false. And then I, I, I processed through my intellectual mind the hidden agenda and the purpose of why the main media would organize to do this. And once again, it became apparent to me uh, that this was, a, it was being used as a brainwashing propaganda mechanism to, to, to stir up deep emotions, because Hollywood knows this, every politician who's a Democrat and Republican knows this, uh, political uh, analysts and political campaign people know this. Things like God, country, the flag, you know, the family. There are certain things that are symbolic and, and press the button on a flood of emotions. That's like 
brainwashed into us, if you will. So I said, you know, um, the emotions rapidly subsided. Again, not because I'm a control freak, but because I recognized that these emotions, although they were sincere on my part, and probably sincere on the part of the vast majority of people who were experiencing the same emotions as me, they were, they, they were brought into being through very skillful manipulation, which implies some kind of experts in mind control. So I'm bringing all of this up to you um, once again, because this topic is one that has been ignored <clears throat> by Christians and conservatives for far too long. We live in a highly sophisticated world. When Aldous Huxley, probably the father of modern mind control, uh, said in 1961 at a convention of neuropsychiatrists at the University of Berkeley, when he said the words, in a truly effective scientific dictatorship, we can program men and women to be slaves, and they will not even be aware of the fact that they're slaves. And then he said that we can brainwash them so effectively that they will be programmed to actually love performing their duties as slaves, and they will love their slavery. And he was talking about the fact that America had already begun this process. Many of the, whatever nation you're listening to me in, if it's a Western nation of any kind, or even not a Western nation, a huge majority of the nations on planet Earth, especially those with communications technology, already live in a scientific dictatorship where they pull out the guns and the armies and the troops as a last resort. The primary mechanism of control is through the media by enslaving your mind. And um, there's no way that God's people in America can, can, can fulfill their individual destinies or their collective destinies, or obey the words of Jesus Christ when he tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, occupy the land until I come. There's no way that we as Christians can do that, that we can obey the Great Commission, unless we allow God to renew our minds with his word, and unless we do what the Bible says, which is we're not to be ignorant of our enemies or Satan's devices. And one of those devices is mind control, because mind control comes from ancient sorcery and magic and has to do with spiritual deception. So every Christian, the church, and we live in the last days, and one of the prime spiritual battles that we're all involved in, whether we know it or not, is the battle against spiritual deception and the battle against propaganda and mind control uh, and sorcery, things of that nature. And unless you're aware of it and you know technically how to deal with it, you can't just have an abstract understanding about it. Unless God's people are up to speed, they're going to get defeated. Souls will not be saved. We will lose control over our country. And uh, the evil one will win. I'm very serious about this. You see, if the Church of Jesus Christ in pre-Nazi Germany um, were reading the Word of God, had their minds renewed by the Word of God, and had under, and, and understood, as they should have, the strategies that Hitler and the Nazis and the occult forces that were behind them were using against the Germans and the church. If they had had wisdom and knowledge, they could have defeated these satanic forces behind Hitler and the Nazis, and the whole Holocaust thing didn't have to happen. And I could name a nation after a nation where great evil could have been prevented had the church been awake, both spiritually and intellectually. That's what's meant by a great awakening. So, 
It's my prayer and hope that you will share this burden with me. Spread this message far and wide to people that need to hear it. Help educate people. And you can do that by going to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Um, I'll have an article on this up in the next day or two. Visit paulmcguire.us. We have lots of uh, uh, books on uh, discounts uh, if you want to use them as Christmas presents to reach people with truth. We have the free archives of the Paul McGuire Report. We have the new television, prophetic emergency alerts. We have uh, video documentaries. We have all kinds of stuff for you at paulmcguire.us. But help spread the word because most people that you're going to talk to were just overcome by the emotion. Now, many people are going to say, well, just because they were overcome with the emotion, they didn't change their attitudes. But this is where that calculation is wrong. What people fail to understand is that all mind programming, whether it's advertising, whether it's propaganda, whether it's mind control, it always occurs in the subconscious mind, not in your conscious mind. So you think falsely that, okay, I was overcome with emotion, but it's not going to really change me. You're incorrect. Overcoming with emotion that's connected to strategic principles of scientific mind control is designed to transform your belief system, your behavior, and your beliefs without you realizing it. The, the change occurs in the subconscious mind. And so there's no, there's no observable evidence that people are brainwashed most often because the transformation is designed to happen deep in their subconscious. And, 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 but it will show, show, show itself up in the physical world rather, rather soon. So this is just one example of a mass mind control operation. We are being bathed in this by the mainstream media, the entertainment media, and education, and many different sources uh, 24-7. Every day, whether it's all the messages that come at us through sitcoms, which are teaching us and programming us to believe things and do things that are against the Bible, uh, it's coming at us from every angle. It doesn't mean we have to be paranoid, but it means that we need to do what the Bible teaches us to do, that we're supposed to have power, love, and a sound mind. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That can be done. We have resources at paulmcguire.us to help you do it and teach others. And remember, we are able to move forward and communicate this truth which sets free and wins souls because we have people like you that have chosen to be intercessory prayer warriors and partner with this ministry. People like you who have chosen to spread the links of our messages far and wide. And people like you who seek the Lord and truly go to the Lord with an open mind and ask him, Lord, how can I help Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church? And then I thank you for your obedience in doing whatever God tells you to do regarding um, financial contributions and donations. Together, we can change the direction of this nation and the world. We can. It's a winnable war. If each one of us will do our part. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us.